How about last month when we had a bunch of artists in the house? Can you give them a hand for being so bold? That's so cool. Thank you, worship team, too, speaking of artists. Um, this, this week, I thought we could focus on things that we long for, and I titled tonight's message, Love Sick Longings. Have you ever had a longing for something? Yeah, Can you, does something come to mind right away that you don't mind sharing? I don't tell us the naughty stuff you long for, just, <laughs> we don't need to know that. What do you long for? Babies, Babies. what was that? F relationship, family, healing, friendship. No one's gonna say chocolate cake after the fast in January? I did, I did. A little bit. <laughs> You're laughing like you guys have a story. <laughs> I can see it. I can see it in their eyes. There's so many things that we long for. You guys, go take yourself all the way back. You guys remember the day, the first boy? When am I going to see him? What am I going to wear? What am I going to say? Is he going to give me a note? Oh, wait, that's like way aging me. <laughs> It's so funny, some of the things that we long for in our hearts. Think of the, the more practical things like the career, right? Or financial freedom, right? Or the house. Well, now we got the house, but now we need the couch. And oh, man, the paint is looking bad. Matter of fact, everything we just put in the house, put everything over it and tape the walls, we're going to paint the whole thing. Why do we do that after we move in, right? There's things that we long for and it feels like it's just never satisfied. I laugh at some of the things that I've longed for over the years and to be honest, nearly all of the things that I could remember, none of them happened. Not one. I was thinking of where I wanted to live, Florida. What I wanted to do, be an anesthesiologist. Where I wanted to go, like every, I like sat down and thought of like all these things, probably five or six different things and not one that I would long for as a young person came true. I don't think that I had in my heart as a young person, I long to know God most high. I don't think that that ever entered my mind. It wasn't a thought that I can ever remember. If anything, my thought about God was, he's scary, right? Like there's different things that you have or thoughts that you have of God, but longing for God was definitely not my first longing. Most of them had to do with food or friends or boyfriend or where I'm going to move or what I'm going to do or what I'm going to drive or what I'm going to wear. The longings were so selfish, right? I want that person to do this thing for me. Have you been there? The longings that we have are crazy. They often involve a who for me. Sometimes it was a what, a where. And then how about what you want to become? I want to become, I don't know, little girls. I want to be a bride, right? A princess. How many girls have said that in their life? Did you guys ever watch the Hallmark movie where you become the princess because the guy came to America and he was a secret princess? Or a secret prince, you know the movies, right? Like that longing for something that's so hilarious when you really think about it. But then there's those really serious ones where you feel like, gosh, God never really met me there. It's a lovesick longing. In my life, I've had dead longings or deceived longings. Like, I long for something so much. That job, that car, that house, that relationship. And then I got to it, and it never satisfied the longing that I had in my heart, right? It's a deceived longing. Like I'm hungering for this thing, but really it never was gonna satiate me from the very beginning. The thing that I was longing for was deceiving really to, to satisfy. It's kind of dead, if you will. I, there's this chapter 78, just a few chapters before here in the book of Psalms. Um, it was really the psalmist is praying for the next generation to not be like the last generation. The last generation was kind of naughty, and they're praying this prayer, and it says this, that they may have their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments, and may they not be like 
their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation. And here's where we're going to start. A generation that did not set its heart aright. And when it's talking about that, it's talking about the inner man, the mind, the will, the heart, the soul, the understanding, and the set of appetites that we have, the things that we long for that we would set our heart aright or that our longings would be for the things that please God. These interesting longings that never satisfy would go by the wayside and we would be lovesick for the most high God and for his courts. When you go back to those days, do you kind of get embarrassed? Like, whoa, I can't believe I wanted that thing. That's so silly. And even now, it's more of like with social media, it makes it that much more because you're in the comparison game now and you long for things that somebody else has whether it be, um, I don't know, it could be body image, right? It could be to be the chef that they are, to have the, the account that they have or the following that they have. There's just these things that are so superficial that we still, if we're not paying attention to our appetite, we crave, right? So like, how do we switch the longing? It's just a little bit of willingness, just a tiny bit of willingness to take inventory of our hearts. It's a tiny bit of willingness to dive into the word of God and let him satiate us. Because what happens is this, when we satiate ourselves in the word of God, we start to hunger for more of what? Yeah, because whatever we eat, we get a hunger for, right? Did you ever notice that? You start to acquire a taste for something if you do it. The first time we love to say it like this, it's a drudgery, right? It's hard to get into the word of God. It might feel like weird or I don't understand it or I don't know it. And then it becomes a little bit more like a discipline. And then finally, it's a delight, right? It becomes a delight. We can't wait to get with God because we can't wait to see what he has. And so my question for you tonight is what is your heart set on? What are you longing for? So the book of Psalms are, these different Psalms are like journal writings from different authors. And this particular author is pouring out his heart, one of the sons of Korah, about what happens to the person who longs for God. And actually, I love when you're reading the Psalms, don't they encourage you to be real and raw? Do you see like David pouring out his heart here, pouring out the heart, just really truly saying, why are you discouraged, oh my soul? Like really talking, basically self-talk, like get right with God, you're, you're a mess. I love that they're just that raw because what it does in us is it, and it, it increases our faith that wow, they're real men crying out to this great, crazy, big God and they're fearlessly just laying before him exactly what they feel like and think like. And that's what he's encouraging us to do in this particular psalm. I can't imagine, this is what I was thinking of right before I opened um, tonight. I was just thinking of, imagine if we get to the, the day that we die and literally this is our response to him. Sorry, God, I was just too busy. Can you imagine how heartbreaking? Didn't make time for you. Didn't care enough to let you be back in position number one. Can you imagine how heartbroken God would be? Not just then, but now if we're not there. And this isn't to shame us, but it's just how sad will we be? Right? How sad will we be when we enter into heaven and we're so excited to meet God and the one thing that we're thinking is, man, I wish I would have spent more time with you. I wish I would have gotten to know you better. I wish that I could walk in so excited to meet you because just one minute ago or just yesterday you told me these crazy revelations about heaven and now I can't wait to see what you just told me about. Is there that kind of longing or is it hunger there? Here's the deal. The enemy knows that we have these weird desires to be satiated and so he always throws distractions our way to keep us from this, but then also our flesh, this pursuit or this desire to have a lovesick longing for God, but also our flesh keeps us away. And so asking the Lord tonight, this is what we're going to do. Ask the Lord tonight to give us a little willingness to check ourselves. Are you willing? Let's take a look. Psalm 84, we're going to pick it up in verse one. I'm going to read it in the New King James and I'm going to kind of commentate in a couple other um, translations. This is the way more godly than me psalmist writing this. You ready? Here's where I said, I can't even read this without lying. How lovely is your tabernacle, O Lord of hosts. My song, my soul longs, yes, even faints for the courts of the Lord. 
I got to that verse and I was like, okay, I long to know you. I long and I hunger for your courts, but faint? My soul faints for you. Can you imagine longing for something so much that you literally lose life over it? Right? How many things? I just think of when we put our heart to something, oftentimes I'm thinking of stuff like, like athletics. We'll put our heart, mind, and strength in something like that. Kids will be up at the crack of dawn and all the way till 10 o'clock at night at some tournament or some event. But do we long for God the way we long for athletics? Think about it. No, seriously, like take inventory. Am I training the next generation to long for the things of the world or am I training the next generation to long for the things of God? Guilty. Totally messed that up. It's crazy when you think about, we don't even know we're training. But when I read that verse and I say my soul longs, yes, it even faints for the course of the Lord. Now I've had family members faint on a football field, but I have never fainted because I was pursuing God so hard. Convicting, right? Next verse, let's move on. Uh, my heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young, even your altars, O oh Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell. I love this one. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. When I look at this verse, I just think of the word dwell, to live with, to be with, to follow closely, to set our gaze upon to sit with, to listen, dwell. Think of your dwelling, where you live. This lovesick longing. This is in the, um, the, the Passion Translation, these first couple of verses. This is what it says. God of heaven's armies, you find so much beauty in your people. They're like lovely sanctuaries of your presence. Deep within me are these, literally, this is the Passion Translation. Deep within me are these lovesick longings, desires and daydreams of living in union with you. When I'm near you, my heart and my soul will sing worship with joyful songs of you, my true source and spring of life. I love this, the, the, the thought that came to mind when I read that. Worship is where God dwells and satisfies every longing. Say that word with me. Worship is where God dwells. So when you see people in this space of literally professing who God is through worship, God of the universe is coming down. And literally it says, you're like a sanctuary to me. When you're in that space of worshiping God and you want to like, Give God praise for who he is. The word declares that he'll dwell where worship is. Is that an amazing promise? So why do you think the enemy hates when you worship? Right? He doesn't want you dwelling with God. He doesn't want God dwelling through you on earth, right? So when we go to worship, there's always going to be an interruption or a distraction. It's crazy. Um, John 7, 38 and 39 says this. It says, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the spirit whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. This text is so interesting to me because remember we were talking about appetite and thirst. It says, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. So if you're coming to God and you're drinking in who he is, out of you will flow rivers of who he is. Is that an incredible promise? So it's, it's no wonder like when we're, when we're trying to set our attention, we're trying to set our affection, the seat of your heart toward the most high God. It's no wonder that enemy doesn't want you to live there, right? So the pursuit of the Lord has to be one where it's intentional, right? One where you choose to follow after, where you choose to go for. And that's what I think is so interesting. It says, if anyone comes to me, think of James 4 where it says, if you draw near to God, what does he do? It's crazy. And the outcome, verse four, I love the, the, 
there's two different translations here. It says, what joy for those who can live in your house always singing your praises. And that's blessed, right? Like what joy or blessed. And the passion, what pleasure fills those who live every day in your temple, enjoying you as they worship in your presence. This, this blew my mind. When I read this in the Aramaic, so this is one of the original languages that the Old Testament was written, and it said, this is crazy. It's totally opposite of what I thought it was gonna say. It says, how blessed is the Son of Man with you, as his helper. You guys, are you listening to me? How blessed is the Son of Man because you are his helper? And what do you mean? What do you think he means by that? What does that mean? When you say helper, don't you just think of husband and wife? It's like easy, right? It's like you're called, if you're a wife, to be your husband's helper. Sorry if that's new news. <laughs> we could talk offline later. But in the same way, if the bride of Christ, every one of us, is married to the groom, Jesus Christ, we're called by God to be his helper. But it pleases him that we are his helpers. Does that just make you feel like, whoa, this just totally changed my relationship with the Lord? In a sentence, the Aramaic totally changed my thought process of that particular verse. He is so pleased that you are his helper. And the one verse that came to my mind was out of 1 Corinthians 5, and it talks there about how you are an ambassador for Christ, and you were called by God to reconcile, like he reconciled you to the Most High God and forgave you of your sin. Now you are called to reconcile people around you back to God. That's the way that we get to be his helper. Is that crazy? He is so blessed. He is so blessed by you. I just thought that was the sweetest thing. How blessed is the Son of Man with you as his helper. This is an interesting thought. If I'm longing for the things of the world, I'm going to hunger more for the things of the world. We just talked about this. But if I'm longing for the things of heaven, that's what I'll have more hunger for, right? If I keep hungering for more, I'm gonna keep wanting more. And we always talk about, and I know you guys will know this as soon as I say it, you can have as much of God as you want. You can have as much of God as you want. So the more you seek him, the more you get with him. The more you have from him. The more understanding, the more richness in him. The blessings that overflow from him, right? It's not this um, ill-motivated reason for seeking him. I want a pink Cadillac. I always use that as an example because I know nobody in here is asking God for a pink Cadillac, right? Sorry if you are. <laughs> but the idea is as you draw your heart near, everything your heart ever longed for, all of those things we mentioned earlier, satisfy. And everything in the world can offer is just icing on the cake. Are those things bad to long for? Family, relationship, babies, are those bad to long for? Absolutely not. No. But what I felt like God was trying to show me this week when I was reading this is I have the order on the totem pole messed up. Like, I have little idols in my life, right? I have some things that are at the top that really should be below him, if you will. And so he's making me remember, I should long for the things of God, not the things of the world as much as I do. I love this. It says, a heart set on him is a highway to his holiness. Let's check it out in verse five. What joy for those whose strength comes from the Lord, who have set their hearts in one translation, their minds in a different translation, on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. I'm gonna pick it up in the Passion. It says this, same exact verse. How enriched are those who find their strength in the Lord? Within their hearts are the highways of holiness. We talked about this before. But picture your heart. When you're connected to God, it's a road, not just to God. You guys, this is so funny. Our logo, I feel like it just always comes up. But your heart is a literal highway to holiness. You get to know God, and he gets to walk on your life to people around you. You are a highway of holiness. The most high God desires to walk his life out through you and in you to everybody around you. It's funny because this, this actual verse translates your heart is a road away that leads to God's presence. A way cast up. 
And you guys remember Jacob's Ladder? Another translation is, it's a ladder. Isn't that cool? I always joke around and say, you're like a portal to heaven, you're a meeting place. But it's true, it's actually true. I'm not just making it up, it's biblical. You're a ladder, is what that translation says. Your heart becomes a ladder to the Most High God. Say that with me, my heart becomes a ladder to the Most High God. I get to be a highway of holiness so that he can travel on me. Okay, Peter and John, they knew this. They observed Jesus. They walked with Jesus. They watched him heal. They saw him die a brutal death. They saw him be buried. They saw him rise from the dead and ascend into heaven. And in Acts 3, you see the picture where they go to the beautiful gate. They're going to the temple to pray. It's 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And on their way to pray, there's a man who they drop, not them, but other people, drop this man at the gate called Beautiful every day. And he's there, hey, Maya. (laughs) He's there every single day to collect what? He's looking for a handout from man, right? Peter and John come in, and I love what it says. They see him. I want you to think about who you see around you. Do you see that they're looking for things of the world around you? Do you take notice, and then are you willing to be vertical, a highway of holiness at the beautiful gate to the lame beggar? That's what you get the opportunity to do everywhere you go, no matter where you are. You get to be the beautiful gate, a highway of holiness to the lame beggar. Now, let's not call our friends lame beggars. I mean, you can, but you might not have as many friends as you once had. You can blame me if you want to. But this is the deal. They go into the temple, and as they're going, and this beggar is there begging, They say, he says, he's reaching out for money, and they say, silver and gold I do not have, but what I have, what? I give you, in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. I don't know about you, but I would way rather have that gift than any silver or gold to give, ever, Right And in the name, they watched Jesus. They looked at the need of man, and they offered to him what they received from the Most High God. Have you done that today? Have you offered to somebody what you received from the Most High God? Do you have a lovesick longing for them? Just like we just talked about in 1 Corinthians, you're an ambassador of the Most High God. You're called to reconcile people back to God, just like Peter and John, when they were walking to the gate, beautiful. But ask yourself that question. Do I have a love, sick longing for the heart of the Father for his people who do not know him? Is that in me? And if it's not, can I start praying it? Right? Do the little kids that I work with know him? Do their families know him? As I walk into the hospital where I work, does everybody there know Jesus? Do they know that they can come to me for prayer? Right? If, do I have a love sick longing for the people around me to be healed in the name of Jesus? Am I bold enough to pray for healing? Am I bold enough? Do I have faith enough to ask God for healing? Or do we shrink back and just let the next person go right? and get the blessing? God can't wait to show up. He can't wait to walk on your highway of holiness. And let you, and I love this. I think it's really funny that they can't really find the beautiful gate. They just assume it's another gate. And honestly, it's Jesus, right? The beautiful gate is actually Jesus. Because what did Peter and John, what did they give him? Only what Jesus gave them. Nothing else, right? So what they received from God, they gave away. And that's exactly what he desires for you to be. A beautiful gate a highway to heaven, a meeting place. Psalm 1611 says this, you will show me the way of life, granting me the joy of your presence and the pleasures of living with you forever. He wants to let you do the things that he did. He says that you'll do greater things than he did. Can you imagine? I want you to say that with me. I can 
do greater things than Jesus. Does that sound like sin? (laughs) I feel like I just sinned. But the no, the reality is, is his word, he, in his word, declares that you will do greater things than him. What? That's a promise for you. Do you believe it? Do you? Yes. You want to walk and operate in the authority that he gave you. Stand firm in who he designed you to be with your identity confidence in him. No glory for you, no glory for me, but for him. And I love that they said, silver and gold I do not have, but what? And I really feel like they should should have said, but who I have, I give you. And then they say, in the name of Jesus. Do you know how powerful? We sang about it yesterday, you guys, the power of the name of Jesus. It deserves an hour of silence, right? The power of the name of Jesus at the mention of his name. At the mention of his name. Say his name. Speak his name over your household. Pray his name over everybody that you come into contact with. Don't neglect the mention of his name. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. Do we have this lovesick, deep longing, not dead longing or deceived longing, but a deep longing to live at the gate like Peter and John? Beautiful. Isaiah 26 says that you will keep in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. I had a a friend, we have some friends in Israel right now, and they text praying and saying, can you please pray for us? They're putting us in lockdown because it's just crazy over there today. And, And I was like, yeah, absolutely. But they have this confidence. They're like, we know where we are. We know where we're going. We have this faith. And you can just sense in their text, they're not fearful They're just looking for agreement, right? They're not fearful, but they're standing firm in trusting the Lord no matter what happens. Why? Because their eyes are fixed on. So when you're being the gate, beautiful, and you get to participate with Jesus, there's going to be a lot of opposition. There's going to be times when we want to rise up, the world wants to rise up and cause us to fear, or we want to shrink back because what do they think? I'm in an office full of nine believers. Are we making an impact Do we have any impact? Not to shame us, but are we taking hold of what God wants to do through you? I don't want you to miss out on what he has for you, right? He has so much for you. Let's keep going. In the book of Psalms, I love this. Chapter 84, verse 6, when they walk through the valley of weeping, it will become a place of refreshing springs. The autumn rains will clothe it with blessing. And the, tra- the other translation I was hitting on, the Passion says, even when their paths wind through the dark valleys of tears, this is what they do. When the tears are flowing, this is what they do. They dig deep to find a pleasant pool where others find only pain. He gives them He gives to them a brook of blessing filled from the rain of an outpouring. And I just want to brag on one of our friends right now who is basically paralyzed from botulism. In the face of opposition, losing every ounce of function, I don't know which parts of her body, but to the point where she has a trach, to the point where she cannot open her eyes, to the point where she cannot open her mouth, to the point where she cannot lift her hands. In the face of this opposition, I want you to ask yourself, how would you respond? If every ounce of your body wasn't able to function the way that it just did yesterday, this was like an overnight within a couple of days, this happened. And she's in the hospital and her son and her granddaughter are in there. And her granddaughter hears her grandma say, or write, I don't remember if she wrote it or if she spoke it. I think it was written. I think she could only move her hand like to write something. And she said, Can you please lift my hands? I want to praise Jesus. Are you kidding me? She had one lift one hand and the other lift the other hand. While nothing in her had any strength, the things she asked the people around her to do were lift her arms so she could worship the one that was worthy. Are you kidding me? Come on. Yes, God deserves glory. Clearly. 
There's been revelation of the most high God and she has longed for deep things or she wouldn't land in that place. She would land in the place of agreeing with the spirit of pain, of agreeing with the spirit of fear or anger. But instead, she agrees with who God says he is and stands firm and says, daughter of the most high God, lifting her arms to who deserves worship. And the whole generation, actually two generations after her, get to witness worship in the midst of pain. Can you imagine if this whole room gets the opportunity to suffer like that and testify like that? That's incredible. It's incredible. This is Psalm 42, 1 and 2. It says, as the deer longs or pants for streams of water, so I long for you, O God. I thirst for the living God. My heart is breaking. This is just a paraphrase of this text. It says, why am I so discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? I will put my hope in God. I will praise him again. My God, now I am deeply discouraged. Do you love how it goes back and forth? Do you guys ever waffle? One day you're praising, the next day you're flailing. Tangled. It's the movie Tangled. I, she's so glad she's free and mom, she's going to be dead because her mom's going to find her. You know, the whole thing. That's what I feel like this. Like my heart is breaking. Why am I so discouraged? I will praise you. Why am I so discouraged? Each day the Lord pours his unfailing love upon me and through each night I sing songs praying to God who gives me life. How refreshing is this psalmist here? wrestling for sure. It's very clear that he's wrestling, but he's still willing to go to God in the wrestling match, right? Just willing. Psalm 84, 7. They will continue to grow stronger, and each of them will appear before God in Jerusalem. Oh, I love this. The Passion says this. They grow stronger and stronger with every step forward, and the God of all gods will appear in Zion. Check this out. Every step forward brings you to Zion. What's Zion? It's a city where God dwells. It's the place where God dwells. So every step toward him, you're closer and closer, right? Not only to being with him here and now on that highway of holiness, but as we do that, we're, we're actually looking forward to heaven, but also here and now, where God dwells. Remember the very first verse, he sees every one of you like little what? Sanctuaries. I love it. Verse eight, we'll finish this up. Oh Lord, God of heaven's armies, hear my prayer. Listen, oh God of Jacob. Verse nine, oh God, look with favor upon the king, our shield. Show favor to the one you've anointed. I love this one. I just was telling my friend, she reminds me of this verse. Your wraparound presence is our defense. In your kindness, look upon the faces of your anointed ones. I feel like this is such a crazy, cool revelation of who God is. In verse eight, it says, listen, O God of Jacob. Do you remember who Jacob was? The one who did what with God? He wrestled. I think it's funny, we were just talking about wrestling. He wrestled with God. And what was he named after he came out from that wrestling match? Israel, what does that mean? Governed by God. So here's the deal. Jacob was a deceiver. Israel, governed by God. He had gone through a whole bunch when he was Jacob that really was a mess, right? But I love how he says, oh God of Jacob. Even when we're a hot mess, he can't wait to father us and lead us into that highway of holiness that you were always meant to be, Amen. Look with favor upon the king. He stands so confident that God will do exactly what he's saying. Show favor to your anointed one. In this verse where it said that translation, your wraparound presence, when God loves you and takes care of you through humans, that's his wraparound presence. There's times when it's an absolute miracle and there's no way you should have been protected and you know, no, that he sent a host. The armies of angels came and protected me in that moment. But then there's times when he takes a loving brother or sister in the Lord and he encourages you through humans. Have you been there? Have you received that? The wraparound presence of the most high God. It's pretty incredible. Are you so thankful for sisters and brothers in the Lord? Yeah. And here's one of my favorite verses. We got three more and we're done. 
A single day in your courts is better than a thousand anywhere else. I would rather be a gatekeeper in the house of my God than live the good life in the homes of the wicked. And my translation says this, for just one day of intimacy with you is like a thousand days of joy rolled into one. I'd rather stand at the threshold in front of the gate. Say it with me. In front of the gate, beautiful, ready to go in and worship my God than to live without you in the most beautiful palace of the wicked. Remember how I said I read this and I feel like a liar? In the beginning, I faint. My soul longs and I faint for you. There's times in my life where I've like, I've felt and I've experienced God's presence so much, I just long to be there again. You know that feeling? Like, oh, I was worshiping and God did this thing and the weight of his glory was so big and, and God let me lay hands on someone and they got healed and God a lot. And there's those moments and we call that from glory to glory. You experience his glorious presence, then you don't, then you do, then you don't, then you do. And it, it should be a little bit more steadfast as you continue to seek God with your whole heart. It's not as up and down. It's a little bit more like this. But because we can have as much of him as we want, we can truly have access to the beautiful gate all day, every day, right? And I love that it says right there, okay, I have to compare it to the wicked palace though. I just think of the crazy Hollywood star that has everything, that has the multi-million, billion dollars but hungering for and being with and experiencing the joy of the Most High God, everything else in this world seriously melts away. It's gone. It's literally gone. When you've experienced healing or if you've experienced restoration in your marriage or if you've watched your kid be a prodigal and suddenly they came back to God, you cannot believe how good God is. And then there's those little things where he shows up and you're like, I can't believe you just did that. No one knew that but you, God. You know those moments? How did that happen? I would rather be there at the very edge of the gate, beautiful, watching him walk on the highways, all of you, of holiness, than ever living in the palace of the wicked. There's no greater place to be. We're going to pray that over you guys. Verse 11, for the Lord God is our son. Worship team, you can make your way up, please. Our son and our shield. He gives grace and glory. The Lord will withhold no good thing from those who do what is right. Actually, just Rach. I don't think we need the whole vocals yet. He holds no good thing. This is another translation. It says, for the Lord is brighter than the brilliance of a sunrise, wrapping himself around me like a shield. He's so generous with his gifts of grace and glory. Those who walk along his paths with integrity, I think that that part is key, will never lack one thing they need, for he provides it all. The the verse there, that part that hits me hard is there's so many times where we feel like we're lacking, but I love how it promises those who walk along his path. And I want to I liken it to what we just talked about, the highways of holiness, the ones who are willing to let him walk out his life through your life here on earth. When you're there, you will lack nothing. Why? Because he's the one that satisfies greater than anything in this world will satisfy. So if you're dwelling with him, if you're in the courts of the most high God and you have deep, deep longing for the things of God, nothing will satisfy you more than that. You'll be the most satisfied human on the planet. And here are some things Psalm 91 promises if you take refuge in the Lord. You'll find rest. You'll find safety. Rescue from the enemy and deadly disease. He will cover you. He will shelter you. His promises are your armor and protection. Evil will not touch you. And if you make the Lord your refuge, no evil will conquer, no plague. And he orders his angels. You guys know how many angels he has? He orders his angels to protect you wherever you go. They will hold you up with their hands. You will trample lions and serpents. Do you guys believe that? You will trample lions 
the, the enemy and his little cohorts. You will trample lions and serpents. I will rescue those, here's the key, who love me. They dwell in my courts. They let me walk on their highway of holiness, to holiness. He protects those who trust in the name. When we call, he will answer, and he rewards them with long life. We're talking eternity here. Life forever with him and salvation. And last verse says, Psalm 84, O Lord of heaven's armies, what joy for those who trust in you. I love this translation. It says, O Lord of heaven's armies, what euphoria fills those who forever trust in you. Do you have love sick longings like the psalmist declared? It's interesting, Jesus is the gate and you, you have that choice to enter. You know how it says enter in the narrow gate, by the narrow gate? Enter by the narrow gate. And it's, it says that there are few who will find it. And it says, does it break your heart that that's true? That it, it, it literally breaks my heart that there's people that we know, there's people that we love who haven't had the opportunity to walk with the Lord in that way. And so I just wanna take a minute to pray for anybody in here who hasn't said yes to Jesus as Savior and then as Lord, but also, do you have a loved one? Do you have a neighbor? Do you have somebody that you work with that you know you're just not sure where they're at with the Lord? If you could just have them in your mind as we're praying and just pray with me for them, if you will. Just be getting their name in your mind. Father, we, we say thank you more than we can ever even imagine, you love this one or few that we're thinking on right now. And we just wanna say thank you for drawing them to our attention. Thank you that you know, they're, it says in your word that you know they're going out and they're coming in. They're lying down when they're asleep, when they're awake, where they go. We wanna say thank you that you're a God who cares greater than we could ever imagine for each and every one of them. And we pray in Jesus' name that you would find that they would find you, that you would find their attention fixed on you and they would say yes to you as Savior. And I pray, God, that there would be a, an urgency in the hearts of those sitting here right now, that there would be a desire to share your love, to share your truth, to speak forth and declare over promises that your word says about what you have in store for each and every one of them if they were to turn to you. So we pray, God, that there would be declarations of life spoken over every friend. We, God, we say, in Jesus' name, would you bring them home? In Jesus' name, would you draw them near? In Jesus' name, would you do the absolute miracle in their heart? Father, we thank you that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one gets to the Father except through him. And if there's anyone in here who hasn't heard the gospel and hasn't had the opportunity to say yes to Jesus publicly. We're just gonna take a second to share that. And I know that you probably know by now that you might be a sinner, right? There's things that we do throughout life where we know that we fall short and the Bible declares that if any of us, that we all, not just one of us, all of us fall short of the glory of God, right? anyone who chooses to sin. And the coolest thing about that is God didn't leave us in that place and say, too bad, you're on your own. You have to pay for that penalty forever. He says, no, I'm gonna send my son from heaven to live a perfect, sinless life. And then as he dies on the cross for your sin and my sin, that death will pay the penalty of everything you've ever done for eternity if you would just put your faith in the fact that he died for you and he died for me. And so from there, he not only dies in his burial, but he rises from the dead. And because he does that, I love that we're going to celebrate this in a couple of weeks. Death couldn't hold him down. Is that incredible? Say that with me. Death couldn't hold him down. Because he resurrected from the dead, that means his spirit now can give us new life in him in the same way that he, the same power that rose him from the dead, you and I get to have access to all day, every day. And if that's something that's new to you, 
and you've never had the opportunity to put your faith in Jesus, if everybody would just bow their heads with me. And faith, if you want to say yes to Jesus as Savior, if you would, just raise your hand and say, you know what? I know I need a Savior. I know that God sent his son to die for me. And I know I've I've never really truly proclaimed him. If that's you, we'd love to pray with you. If not, we're going to just believe in faith that there might be someone online that might listen in later that you send this message to. And if you would, just pray with me out loud. Say, Lord, all of you, Lord Jesus, I thank you that you died on the cross to save me from my sin that your blood shed paid for every one of my sins. I thank you that as I turn from my sin, you're willing to fill me with your spirit so that I can live this life victoriously, a highway of holiness to draw people unto you by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.